Thank you for joining us. We're going to cover what's known as the demonstration stalls this evening. And this is something that hopefully all pilots are familiar with, but what we've been finding out is that's not the case. And uh, we appreciate you being with us because we know if you're with us tonight, you're one of those very conscientious pilots that does their best to know as much as possible. Uh, you know, we kind of got the choir out there, I guess is the way to say it. And we should plan on it being about 75 minutes or so. So this is each month on the last Tuesday of the month, we do a webinar from the New England FAST team. The Bradley FAST team is Dan Carter and Rob Leonard. And you guys already have uh, pre-planned and have the webinar for next month, February, coming up, don't you, Dan? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, thanks to... Um... Let's see, we got Dave Strasberg helping out with it and uh, Chris Han, one of our local DPEs. Um, they have one on um, how to prepare for your multi-engine uh, check ride and also some uh, tips and tricks for flying multi-engine air aircraft. So that'll be coming up next month. Excellent, excellent. And that's on the last Tuesday of every month we're doing that. And then uh, Rob Leonard is uh, the maintenance FPM from the Bradley Fizdo, and he's actually, you got a webinar tomorrow night on, what is seatbelts, Rob? Yes, we do. We've got a webinar going on tomorrow night uh, about seatbelts seat belts and applications uh, that would be applicable to pilots. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Excellent. So these guys are going to be helping us out tonight. And then uh, myself and John Wood, there's a picture of us flying together. As you've heard my voice a lot, John, you want to say hello so everybody recognizes your voice? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good to have you with us tonight up here in Portland, Maine, where they're saying that we're going to get a little bit of snow overnight. Ground's been bare for most of the winter, and uh, so I guess getting a little bit of snow is right in line with what a New England winter is all about. Yeah. And you have your partner, John Bell, on the maintenance side. Uh, he is not with us this evening. Uh, he started here this year and is going through a lot of training, uh, learning how to handle a lot of different things. So he was unable to be with us this evening, but will be with us in many other things here in the future. So a few housekeeping items. These are questions that people always ask is Wings Credit. Yes, it will get uploaded in a few days as long as you use the same email address uh, to register for this that you have for your uh, fasafety.gov WINGS account. Uh, it will automatically go through. You'll see it uh, show up on your account there. We are recording this and planning on putting it on the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel after. That will take about a week. We do have a few handouts, so do take a look at the handouts tab. And if you haven't taken a look, please do take a look at the Boston Fast Team YouTube channel. We do a recording of our, we put the recordings of our webinars up there, but also we occasionally do some special type programs too, uh, such as you see the airplanes at the airport. That was John and I meeting up uh, earlier this summer and things like that. So take a look at it, please subscribe or like. And if you are not involved in the WINGS program, please, please, please do consider it. You know, we give it two thumbs up, such as this pilot does here for fasafety.gov, because what we're trying to do is promote, educate, and improve. So let's just cover a short overview for this evening on what we are gonna hit upon. And this goes back to really the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee and loss of control work group. What we're gonna talk about is some of the accidents associated with loss of control. Talk about the testing involved with flight instructor applicants, people that are getting their CFI certificate. You know, what are we expecting of instructors? What may be occurring out there? And all of this focused around what's known as the demonstration maneuvers uh, in the practical test standards for the flight instructor airplane. Now we are changing over to the ACS and we'll talk about that a little bit this evening too, but still as of today, we are using the flight instructor practical test standards. And what is it that the GA pilot knows about these demonstration maneuvers? And specifically, what is it that we're trying to understand from these demonstration stalls? Uh, I say maneuvers, but they're all stalls that we do end up covering. 
in the flight instructor practical test standards and the hazards associated with them. So tonight's program is very airplane centric. Um, you know, you, you need the flight instructor in the back to tell you how it's going, where you go, but it definitely also does apply to some other types of categories. It will apply to the glider pilots, which, you know, Dan and I include ourselves in that group, the sport pilots for the airplanes, and even weight shift control, you know, the sport pilots or private pilots flying those. But really, it's going to focus on just these applicable classes of aircraft, all in the airplane category. Now, loss of control really is, you know, number one in terms of the fatal accidents that uh, we end up having. I'm going to just adjust my screen here slightly. Thank you. And, you know, this can come from disorientation, continued VFR and the IMC conditions. And usually that turns into a steep spiral. Many of us probably remember that from our private pilot training, but loss of control can come from distractions, inappropriate response to uh, emergent emergency events, uh, lack of aircraft handling skills, inadequate risk management, all of these. But what is interesting, and tonight we'll be talking about this, and I'm going to change over to the spotlight, is if we look at, you know, back of over a 10 year period of the stall accidents that we had, 20% of them total were fatal accidents. And uh, you guys might be able to see it in the future on the NTSB. The four of us were just looking at a video of a stall accident that occurred here recently. Uh, you know, that's not public information yet, but it will be by the NTSB and where you can very accurately see that the aircraft is stalled uh, as it crashes. Uh, thankfully, no one was killed in that accident, which is a miracle when you do watch it. And what we're really trying to do is work on reducing the total accidents and reducing these fatal accidents. And you'll see a lot of them occur, take off and climb, maneuvering, you know, descent and approach, go arounds, landing. And the type of stalls, the demonstration stalls that are in the uh, instructor practical test standards are very common in these areas. Take off and climb especially, maneuvering especially, descent and approach, go arounds, landing in the traffic pattern, all of this. So we're, these stalls are used to try to teach us something about how the aircraft behaves, why it flies the way that it does, and what we need to do as pilots to try to help us in these areas here, like takeoff and climb, maneuvering, descent and approach, go arounds and landings, to minimize these large accident categories. So people always ask, you know, when I talk about demonstration stalls, what is it that I'm talking about? And this comes directly from, like I said, the Flight Instructor Practical Test Standards. And you can find out more in Chapter 4 of the Airplane Flying Handbook, which is one of the handouts that you do have this evening. But that includes what's known as the cross-controlled stall. We probably all have heard of that. The elevator trim stall. This is one that's usually fairly new to uh, private pilot types secondary stall, and accelerated or accelerated maneuver stall. And I put the asterisk there because in recent years, that has been added to, at first, the commercial practical test standards, which are now the instrument, or which are now the commercial ACS, Airman Certification Standards. Yeah, and if we look at, the um, practical test standards for the flight instructor, this is the note that is included in there. This is for the single engine aircraft is, you know, the examiner must select at least one proficiency stall, which task B or C, which is power off, power on, and then at least one demonstration stall, task D, E, F, or H. And that's what these are. You know, task D, task E, task F, uh, task H and test 
G, if I recall correctly, is the spins, or at least that's the way it is set up. For the multi-engine, is must select at least one task, talks a little bit about the stalls to be performed, but you will also see that the task, it, the one demonstration stall in the multi-engine flight instructor is the accelerated maneuver stall. So this kind of leads us to the first poll question, which I'm going to go ahead and launch. And this is where you will find out it's hard for us to see some things sometimes. So uh, I'm going to ask John to help us out here. Sure, I'm with you. Um, OK, concerning the demonstration stalls and, and maneuvers. Heard of them and tried one or two in my training. All of these are new to me. Found out about them after my training. I am not sure even my CFI knows about them. And I've, I have heard of one or two of them, but that is all. Okay, and this is the classic. You've probably heard it from me before. If not, you've probably heard it whenever you've gone to vote. It's vote early, vote often. <laughs> Would appreciate that. And this will give us a little bit of insight. Now, when we look at the results of this, I do want to emphasize, do remember, I mentioned tonight, all of you out there attending this are the choir. You know, you are the 250 is about what we have on right now. You are the 250 pilots that are very interested in learning everything you possibly can. And, you know, you are what I would call the cream of the crop in terms of trying to do the best that you can. So do recognize that when we take a look at the results to this and think about maybe what some of your fellow GA pilots at your home airport may know about this. I'm gonna close it and share it now. Let's see what we got. All right, the 78% Steve heard of them and tried one or two in my training. Excellent, that's really good. Yes. Yeah, and at 10%, which is the second most uh, popular answer, I have heard of one or two of them, but that is all. Well, that's good. At least it's not completely new to you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And we've done this a, a few times and I'll just share it. Uh, John and I, uh, last time we did this webinar a couple years ago now, this is what we got for the audience. And you'll see, it's great that actually more and more people are finding out um, more about this. So that is absolutely terrific. Uh, I guess the word is getting out. And we even did it, which was a surprise to us. We did it with a small group of examiners. This was about the same 250 plus uh, GA pilots out there, but we did it with a small group of about 60 examiners uh, at one time uh, a few years ago, and this is what they had. And so it looks like now all of you are out there, you know, molding and looking like the examiner group that is out there. So again, just emphasizing that the demonstration stalls, the demo stalls are located only in the flight instructor practical test standards. That's the only place you're gonna normally see it described in terms of a maneuver and also a set of standards that go along with it. There is one major exception to it is the accelerated maneuver stall, which I did mention has had been added a few years ago into the commercial airplane practical test standards. And we'll take a look also at how they have started to integrate into the airman certification standards at the lower levels. So if we look at the instructor PTS, what it says is for proficiency, what they're looking for is what's known as instructional knowledge on the maneuvers. This is the power off and power on stalls that we're all familiar with. You know, and what it is is the applicant should be able to demonstrate the what, why, and how of the maneuver, you know, to a teaching level. They should also be able to do it to a specified standard, which is the commercial, and within the specified criteria in the applicable PTS or ACA, ACS requirements. And then the demonstration stalls. What it is, is we're looking for instructional knowledge and looking for 
the flight instructor applicant to be knowledgeable and proficient in being able to accomplish the maneuver, but we don't have designated set criteria to it. We're looking, one, that they recognize what it is, two, have the ability to demonstrate it, and three, that they know it is a maneuver that we advocate to be used for educational awareness purposes when they're out there training their students. That's one of the things. We advocate that these demonstration stalls by the instructors are introduced at some point in the student's training, you know, say for sport, private, recreational, even commercial, you know, to highlight some of the hazards associated with it, the risks associated with it, and what you can do to mitigate those risks. So on the proficiency part, what we're really looking at is how good are you? How good are you at maintaining a heading, a bank angle, or whatever? And this is to just a set minimum standard. You know, you can work on some variations with it with your instructor, you know, maybe get into it deeper on upset recovery and unusual attitude work and specialized training, so forth and so on. So like I mentioned, the proficiency stalls are the power off, power on, and accelerated. And these are found in the sport PTS or sport pilot PTS, the recreational, the private ACS, the commercial ACS, or the highlight towards the accelerated stall, and the flight instructor practical test standards. And as I mentioned, with the ACS system, we're also seeing it being introduced in there not necessarily as a maneuver to perform, but to show that the applicant has awareness, to show that the flight instructor has at least demonstrated the demonstration stalls to the student from an awareness perspective. And if we look at this, this is the power off stall section of the private ACS. And there's a knowledge element, and then there's the risk management element to it in the skills. And this is, you know, where we talk about maintaining to a specified heading, bank angle not to exceed, altitudes, all of that sort of stuff. But if we go back up to the risk, notice right here, risk item number five on here is that the applicant is aware of the risk and implications of secondary stalls, accelerated stalls, and cross-control stalls when doing power off. So you could get a question, you know, along the lines is, okay, if we if we do enter a stall, how is it that you know you can help keep yourself from getting into an ex secondary stall or an accelerated stall? And you want to be that private pilot applicant that is able to show the DPE or explain to the DPE what you're going to do, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of how you recover or that sort of stuff. You don't want to be that applicant that looks at them with the big wide eyes and goes, what? <laughs> don't want to do that. This already I've talked about, but we have this in the instructor uh, practical test standards, you know, when we talk about the proficiency that they are required for it. And then on the demonstration ones, you know, we talk about this here, is to ensure that the applicant is knowledgeable and proficient in these maneuvers and can teach them to students for both familiarization and stall awareness purposes. That's one of the big bottom lines here, folks. That's what we're trying to do with the demonstration stalls, is use them with all pilots to help with their familiarization and stall spin awareness. You know, it is interesting. I don't do it as much as I used to, but I have trained a lot of CFIs and done a lot of CFI check rides in the past. And, you know, this is a section right out of my plan of action for the uh, flight instructor practical test standards. And it's always interesting, you know, these are questions that I'll go through and ask the applicant just before we get started. And, you know, hey, we're looking at the practical test standards, right? You have the flight instructor airplane practical test standards, change six is the most recent one. Yes. You're familiar with the introductory pages and their relationship? Yeah, and you go through this. But 
it's interesting, you get here often, and this is described out in the practical test standards. Hey, could you tell me what the difference is or what you're looking for or we're looking for when we talk about the demonstration stalls versus proficiency stalls? And that's where you get that blank stare all of the time. And that's one of the things that led us to doing this program. You know, I do think we, we haven't had it become official yet. We probably will see these continue in the new flight instructor ACS, but of course it's not published yet. So that's not definite. You know, maybe we'll get another draft of it coming out soon. You know, I, I checked with the testing department and you can always look at this on what's new in testing and uh, knowledge tests. This was published just back in December is for the ACS's under development with release dates to be determined. Uh, that's for FAA speak from anywhere from one month to 10 years. Uh, it all depends <laughs> on way too many factors, but the aviation instructor ACS is one of those that is out there. However, in the past for comments from the industry, we have released a couple drafts of it. Uh, back in June of 2018, we did release a draft of it and you will see in that draft, these demonstration stalls were included in just like they have been. One of the things that I use these stalls for in teaching students is to talk about what I call the pre-stall and the post-stall variables. How an aircraft behaves when it stalls is dependent upon these factors. And you know, you probably could add even a couple factors that I'm not thinking of, but these are the things that most people seem to get or understand. So what is it that you can do, change, or behave as a pilot that will affect the stall that you do before the stall? You know, and although it may be one, if you're flying with an instructor, you know, flight instructor nervousness, harassment, whatever it may be, I, I don't count that in here because I wanna know what you as the pilot have done. But the rate of onset, how fast that you pull up into the stall or how fast you are decelerating. You know, for certification purposes, on determining stall speeds, you know, in the part 23, part 25, you know, there's a specified rate of less than one knot per second deceleration. And that's what most of us usually end up seeing uh, when we're out there performing like the power off and power on stalls. So rate of onset. Configuration of the aircraft. Most of us are familiar with flaps, but if you got aircraft, retractable gear, not retractable gear, speed brakes, not speed brakes, slats, no slats, whatever it may be. What impact does the configuration you're in prior to the stall or entering the stall have on how the stall behaves? Believe it or not, atmospheric, most of us fly down in lower altitudes, usually at 10,000 feet and below, but up at higher altitudes, you know, in the thinner air, it probably is gonna take longer, take more altitude to recover. And on the ATP uh, multi-engine, that's one of the things that we have included is with the ATP, CTP courses now, that include the simulation training. This is one of the things that uh, we're requiring people to do. The same thing in the practical test standards for the ATP and part 121 air carriers is taking a look at stalls and unusual attitudes at high altitudes in the sim and the impact that the atmospheric conditions may have on there. Along with that, you could probably also consider uh, atmospheric configuration conditions, such as if you have ice buildup or something on the aircraft. That definitely can play a big, big factor to it. In fact, I know I used to teach in a motor glider quite often, and any time that it rained, but it maintained VFR conditions, I always would try to grab an instructor or two and take them up and have them do a stall in the motor glider because it would stall at about seven knot higher airspeed just because of the water on the wing. 
coordination, control displacement, you know, where you have the control input, how much the ailerons, elevator, rudder, all of that are deflected as you approach the stall and when you do. Power, you know, how much power is being produced, torque that's associated with that, aircraft loading, total weight, but also center of gravity. And that has, center of gravity, of course, has a significant role in terms of stall spin awareness, spin recovery. So those are the pre-stall variables that we can take a look at. And then there's also the post-stall. Once the stall occurs, what is it that you do or can do and has an impact on the stall? You know, of course, the amount of power. If you leave full power in and keep the control back, you're probably gonna end up with a much flatter um, stall than you would with the drop of the nose without the power. However, that is dependent upon the aircraft and many other factors too. Pilot input on the controls. What is it that you're doing? Are you leaving the controls fairly neutral or are you putting in large and back and forth inputs? You know, we probably could even talk about this. It was really more so a um, loss of control due to structural breakup, but was it was it late 2001 we had the um, American Airlines Airbus accident in the New York City area where the um, pilot did full deflection each way on the rudder and ended up breaking off? Yeah, I, th I think it might have been, Steve. Yeah, I, I think it might have been 2001, but yeah, that was, uh, that, that, that's an interesting accident for anybody out there to look up, uh, just Google it and uh, the American Airlines flight that, you know, the uh, aircraft came apart in flight um, by Long Island and um, just south of Long Island and and uh, read read up on that, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, but pilot input played a huge, huge factor in that one. Configuration, of course, what are your flap settings, slat settings, all of that. There's gyroscopic and aerodynamic impact on it is, not only gyroscopic in terms of the engine propeller combination, but also of the aircraft, you know, where the fuel is located. Is it along the longitudinal axis or along the lateral axis? Is there a rotation that has developed or not? What are the aerodynamic forces that develop on the airframe, especially if you have started to enter a spin? You know, if you look at the old um, T-37, military trainers you'll see a fence along the nose because they had a bulbulous nose to them but a fence along that and that was an aerodynamic to actually spoil a lift across the nose when you were in a spin and there's multiple aircraft out there that have that design feature to it control position and i say here not pilot induced because as you enter a stall and maintain it or stall spin is depending upon the aircraft the control position in the aerodynamic loads on the controls may make them go one way or another and if you let that happen it may behave one way if you don't let that happen it may behave another way i used to teach uh, aerobatics in a zlin 242l uh, check aircraft with a uh, like homing engine in it. And that was one of the things that we used to purposely use it to demonstrate because the controls would go into certain positions. And also, if you let them stay there over a period of time, they'd be difficult to get out of those positions. Duration, how long you keep it or hold it in the stall is really a big, big factor. Many of us have done the falling leaf maneuver, you know, where you keep it in the stall using the rudder you know, and to have worked on that, you know, it's a way to help you feel the stall, how it works and everything. But the longer you keep it in the stall, the more impact it will have on how the stall behaves. So those are all big things that we'll talk about and we can use the demonstration stalls to show us because these are the ones where we do things either the pre-stall variables or the post-stall variables a little bit differently from what we typically do. Now, the first one that we'll talk about is the cross-controlled stall. 
And this is what the airplane flying handbook has to say about it. You know, occurs when critical angle attack succeeded. Yep, that's a given on a stall. <laughs> With aileron pressure applied in one direction and rudder pressure in the opposite. You know, so what we're basically talking about, and I'm going to start to use the webcam here a little bit, folks, but you know, what we're talking about is setting it up so that, oops, let me move it this way, is the relative wind is coming at the aircraft at an angle versus directly off the nose. You know, and we can set it up that it comes from either side. You know, detrimental that we talk about is the skidding uh, cross control stall in the traffic pattern when executing the base to final if we overshoot it. And here's a little thing to give you an idea. This is actually from the Soaring Safety Foundation, and this is one of their little trigger videos that they ask, you know, instructors to use to discuss with their students is to watch this short video and then discuss what happened. Now in this video, it is a simulation. It does have the classic turn and bank indicator, but also in gliders is the telltale um, up on the windshield, the blue yaw string. Uh, that'll show you what's happening with the relative wind. And notice off to the side. So we don't want to see that, but that's what it would look like uh, if we were to inadvertently do a cross-controlled stall turning onto the base and final leg. You'll notice that it will tend to dip down in as you're making that skidding turn. It will tend to dip down into the direction that the aircraft is banked, in this case here to the left, and then rotate around there. And this is scary. If you ever have seen this happen, it is not, in real life, not a good sight to see. Here, Now, in the current airplane flying handbook, this is one of the things that kind of catches my attention a little bit. And, you know, if you're flying a regular traffic pattern, really where people end up having the challenge of getting cross-controlled is that point where they're ending up flying and bank the aircraft, turning, say, downwind to the base leg, and then rolling in from the base leg around to the final. And when that occurs, think about the control inputs that you need to put in in order to do that. Is in order to bank the aircraft, in this example that I'm holding, dropping the left wing towards you, but banking the aircraft to the left, you're going to need to apply left stick and left rudder. What happens if you don't, and gliders are very good at teaching you this, is what's known as adverse yaw, is the down aileron on this wing, trying to lift that wing up will create more drag and the aircraft will yaw in this direction, changing the relative wind from off of the nose to this to over here in relation to it. And what happens is you end up having to make a coordinated rudder and control input to roll in here, then to roll out here, fly level, to roll in again here, you know, both stick and rudder displacement, and then to roll out here. So just in this short area, you have four times where you're making large inputs with the stick and the rudder going into opposite directions. And what has been found, we here in the US are talking about it a little bit, 
but um, Germany, Finland, and a few other countries, at least with their soaring uh, safety programs, have kind of recognized maybe, just maybe, and I emphasize here, that's a big, big baby, is um, we might do something a little bit better. And what they've kind of realized is if you do just a shallow entry, a beam, and just slowly continue to increase the bank angle to roll out on final, all you're really going to have is one point where you're going to have a large stick displacement and need the rudder instead of four. So basically narrowing it from one or from four down to one. And here's a little bit of an example. We'll take a look of this is um, just flying kind of this circular type of approach in a glider. You'll see. Look good speed a bit high. Noticing so. entering a very shallow bank. If you look down in the bottom, you can actually see the telltale. I know it's clear. You do notice just with this shallow bank, it's an increase clear. in shallow bank. Very little change in the telltale. The yaw strength. This is the one point right there where you'll have that large stick displacement and rudder displacement versus the four times on doing kind of the traditional. Welcome back. Yeah, so that's a little bit interesting. There is definitely some debate going on about there. UND AOPA has talked about this some in doing a research project on the airplane side of it. I'm just pointing it out as it's one of those things that not very many people think about, but basically one of the positives with this, and I had not been an advocate in the past, but one of the positives is you're taking a circumstance where you likely could get into a cross-controlled situation four times and bring it down to just one. And that ends up, I think, greatly reducing the risk for a lot of us out there. And it is interesting, you know, you take a look at this, if you've been involved in airplane flying for a while, you probably remember this. This is the old airplane uh, flying handbook where it shows a circular pattern uh, on the 360 degree power off approach, where what they have now is this flying the square uh, 360 degree power off approach or 180 degree, whatever you want to do. Very interesting. But the big thing that we worry about with cross controlled stalls is basically it is one of the few ways that you very easily can get yourself into a spin. You know, and if we take a look here, this is a short video of. 152 spin. Let's see. And you quickly and easily can see how just being significantly cross controlled, in this case here, a lot of left rudder with some right aileron. We talk about the pre stall and the post stall variables. You know, the pre stall variable there <laughs> is the control input, definitely, to get it into a large. Um, cross-controlled situation, but also the post-stall variable is in something like a 152, 172, you pretty much have to keep the controls, you know, into the spin in order to keep it going into the spin. Now, it is interesting, just it's a side note more to this, but that video was from my previous employer where was doing it for our video production. And years later, 
that very same aircraft ended up looking like this. It actually was the aircraft that led to the rudder stop um, AD on the Cessna 150, 152s. Uh, it was that same aircraft doing a spin resulted in this because the um, rudder horn got locked over on the bolt. And it's interesting, it also had happened in Canada before too, and they had an AD on it before the United States did. And um, Transport Canada gives a significant scholarship out in the name of the instructor that was lost in the accident in Canada with it. The second type of stall that we'll talk about for the demonstration stalls is the elevator trim stall. And this is just a stall where you're pretty much set up as if you're coming in for landing. For demonstration purposes, I like to get it all situated and trimmed to power off as if you were doing a short field landing. So your short field approach speed trimmed for that. And then adding full power and watching what happens with it. When you add full power, in most general aviation aircraft, there are a few exceptions, like amphibians uh, are one example, sea rays another, is you will get a very large nose pitching up moment with that. And also many people don't recognize or think about the need to apply right rudder, you know, is torque effect, torque reaction and everything, left turning tendencies are making the aircraft yaw to the left. And if they let it keep going, it can end up being dangerous. And this is very, very common on the approach to landing. You know, this is just a demonstration of what it would look like if you're doing it with a student in the aircraft. And for some reason, so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna bring in full power. You may have noticed in that video how quickly that the nose of the aircraft ends up coming up. You know, that it, with that full power, that was just in a 172, full power, it goes up significantly. You may have also noticed with it and in the recovery when you catch it, because you have to overpower the trim, which is pretty hard in some aircraft, but that it started yawing off to the left and you'll see as the nose was pushed down in the recovery of that elevator trim stall, that there was banked over to the left slightly like that. And if you wanna see an example of where it almost happened in real life, we got yet another video, but do think about it, you know, and it's gonna vary from aircraft to aircraft. You know, this is uh, aircraft I get in a lot nowadays, you know, an L-19, which has 60 degrees of flaps. You know, think about that, the configuration, the pre-stall variable associated with that. This aircraft is one that you have to be exceptionally careful of, of an elevator trim stall. But let's take a look at an example where it almost happened in just your classic 172. Pay particular attention to the rudder or lack of rudder in the yawing motion uh, oh, oh, in this aircraft. Oh, 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 oh my God! Oh, 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 right rudder! Right rudder! Right rudder! Right rudder! Oh, oh, my God. Did you get that on tape? Yeah. Yeah, John, and we would have to thank whoever did get that on tape because we've used it in so many safety programs over the years. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pretty good one, that's for sure. Yeah, it is. Now, thankfully, not a high horsepower. That plays a significant factor on those pre and post all variables as we've talked about. Uh, you know, that was 150 horsepower, 172 in relation to it. But you can see that it does pitch up. At least the pilot, you know, is controlling the trim and the nose pitch with it. But you can also see how easily it is to forget, you know, the torque effect when you apply that power and how much that nose yawed off to the left and how much right rudder was needed but was missing. You know, enough classically you saw everybody there <laughs> hollering, right rudder, right rudder. And, and you know, it's a hard thing, but you, you'd need to recognize 
the edges and where the dangers are. And that's what it is with these demonstration stalls, is you need to be familiar with them in order to avoid them. And each of us in all of our districts have had a few of these accidents end up occurring over time. You know, this was one fairly recent uh, in the Boston FISDO in a barren elevator trim stall on a go around. The downright, that's what it was, and rotated over and hit like this. Believe it or not, thankfully, the pilot got out of this one with just, you know, some bumps and scrapes and uh, shooken up a little bit. Um, you know, that's a testament to how well the aircraft handled, but or held up when hitting the ground. But, you know, we've also seen some big, big tragedies with this. And if you go back and you look at, you know, those number of stall loss of control events um, on takeoff and initial climb out, and then look at the fatalities associated with it, the fatal accidents, you'll see, you know, an elevator trim stall or any stall for that matter, but especially an elevator trim stall near the surface is not a good thing. Third type of demonstration stall is the secondary stall. You know, and this is caused by putting in control inputs a little too abruptly, attempting to return to the desired flight plan, um, you know, not lowering the pitch. This is one of those, you can look at it with kind of two pre-stall variables with your instructor in the demonstration of it, or if you're an instructor, you can demonstrate it one of two ways. One of the more common ways is, you know, you fully recover from the stall and then pull back sharply and suddenly because, say, something had scared you or spooked you a little bit and you end up getting into a secondary stall. Another way that we end up seeing people get into this, uh, and I'm going to have to turn the camera on again, I think, for this, is a situation in powered aircraft where they go and enter a stall say for training purposes especially, but you want to make it aware for where a stall could occur and how to avoid them in regular flying outside of training. But we're entering a stall and to recover from the stall, you add full power, but don't end up reducing the angle of attack with the elevator. It is instead of lowering the nose, you end up just trying to use the power to accelerate out of it is piston powered aircraft does very well propeller driven at providing immediate acceleration and that's what it will do it'll start to get you out of the stall maybe get you through the buffet a little bit but then you're going to get that prop wash over the tail make the tail more effective and just like we saw in the elevator trim stall probably a little bit of increasing pitch and as a result you end up in a secondary stall usually with the nose a little bit higher and a little bit deeper into the stall than you have been in the past. And as we talked about in the post stall variables, that has an impact on how the aircraft is going to behave. You know, it's also dangerous. Uh, actually, one of our DPEs from the Boston area, the latest edition of AOPA magazine, yeah, this one right here right here in my office, folks, <laughs> uh, Neil Singer had uh, written, it was either this month or last month's issue, uh, and I think it was Neil that wrote it, if I, if I recall, if, if, I, if there was someone else, I apologize, but talking about T-tailed aircraft and turbine aircraft, like I uh, used to be familiar with and flew the um, Eclipse jet, where with a high rate of onset or in a secondary stall that the stall propagation can come back and start to blank out the tail and get what's known into a deep stall. As a result, for certification purposes, it's not uncommon in turbine aircraft with T-tails to see a requirement for what's known as a stick pusher, where the aircraft actually by itself, it's automated into the systems is when you get at beyond a certain angle of attack that it will push the nose over on its own under certain conditions. And that was one of the items that the Eclipse had for its certification is from training, testing purposes, you'd be in there and it would, as you approached it, did it verbally, but it would, you know, stall, stall, 
stall. And then when it got to the point that the stick pusher engaged, it would push over and push, 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 you know, announcing that at you. Now, I mentioned probably the most common way on a secondary stall is the person ends up recovering from the stall, lowers the nose a bit, but doesn't like what they see. And this is the classic accidents that we end up seeing of the stalls into the ground. So they pull up too much, you know, and end up stalling into the ground versus doing what Bob Hoover had, you know, told all of us to do is fly the aircraft all the way through the accident. Just keep flying it. Um, and the reason why is they might see something like this in their windscreen that they're just not that comfortable with. And it's hard to overcome, you know, that human reaction to that. That's part of the reason why, you know, we'll advocate for make sure as an instructor and also as a student that you've at least seen these demonstration stalls. You may not be comfortable with doing them all the time, which is perfectly fine, but we want you to have at least seen them out there. And we also advocate go above and beyond if you can. You know, do some unusual attitude recovery training sometime. You know, maybe do a short half day course or something if you're on vacation somewhere where it's more readily accessible than it is at your home airport. Because, you know, you will only start to gain comfort when you have started to learn and see things similar to this and understand how the aircraft flies. The last one, which is actually a proficiency maneuver as we talked about for the commercial, is the accelerated maneuver stall, which most of us are familiar with doing at say 45 degrees of bank. All we're really doing is trying to see what happens and demonstrate with a high load factor, high rate of onset uh, as a pre-stall variable. Yeah. So that's how most of us will end up seeing it. And this is what it looks like in the commercial ACS, what it is that we're looking for, you know, in the knowledge aspects of it, you know, airplane configurations, relationship, angle of attack, airspeed, all of that, stall characteristics of the impending stall, full stall, what are the fundamentals to recovering on it? You know, now in the multi-engine, because we could have asymmetrical thrust, the ACS has a lot of notes or warnings with it, basically emphasizing to us some criteria that we really should be following no matter what we do. But, you know, the big thing in any stall recovery is reducing the angle of attack first, you know. And then once you've done that and have the wings flying, you can work on rolling the wings level next. If you try doing that before recovering and reducing your angle of attack from a stall, you're probably going to exasper, exasperate, if I can get that out without the teeth, <laughs> um, exasperate what it's like in the stall with it. But in the multi-engine, you typically have one engine out here, one engine out there, and you could have the asymmetrical thrust. We want to make sure that we're not applying the power if we are at or below VMC for that particular aircraft. You know, we also want to make sure we're at an appropriate altitude. And most of the time, unless we're doing like an unusual recovery course or something like that, we do want to make sure that we are doing these accelerated stalls coordinated. That way we have, you know, near similar loading on the wings and don't have large control deflections and everything so that we don't create a yawing motion when the stall occurs, that the aircraft will pull up, exceed the angle of attack, and we can then just reduce the angle of attack in order to get the aircraft flying again. So that leads us to our second poll question uh, for this evening is, you're out there flying and you're doing, a coordinated 60 degree steep turn to the left and you end up stalling the aircraft which way will it spin and i want you to think about why classic <laughs> questions that a flight instructor will end up asking uh, because people tend to jump on one answer that it is not and what do we got john 
Okay, Steve, it looks like most people voted for uh, at 35% with no spin, which is good. Um, like you said, there's a lot of smart people out there. Um, but a close okay. second was a right spin and uh, following at 29%, just behind that was a left spin at 20%. And then over in its back and an inverted spin was 16%. Right. You know, normally in a coordinated stall, it, it's not going to spin one direction or another because the coordinated turn like that, the relative wind is coming directly off the nose. It's hitting hitting each of the wings equally. They're both producing the same amount of lift. There is not a rolling moment or a yawing moment that is induced when the aircraft stalls in order to create the spin. You know, and this is one of those things from spin awareness. I'd, you know, we don't have the time to cover it here, but I would encourage you to go talk to a knowledgeable instructor about it is in order to develop the spin, not only you need the wing stalled at different levels of stall, which induces a rolling moment that is also coupled with a yawing moment. And those can feed off of each other. You know, you can have a yawing moment that then ends up creating a difference in the lift on the wings, which in turn, you know, creates the rolling moment. But if you are coordinated, it's not going to end up spinning. And this is something you should go out and do. Go out and do some stalls with the, an instructor at 45 degrees of bank, these accelerated stalls, and see what happens. You'll see. You just pull, and all you have to do is just lower the angle of attack and still be flying, that you're not going to have to worry about it rolling off in one direction or another. Now, when talking about that, do take into account all the pre-stall variables. Uh, with that because there probably are some aircraft out there that it doesn't hold completely true to but just about everything you'll see in general aviation that is a true statement we normally talk about accelerated stalls in the horizontal plane because we're normally doing them with a large amount of bank angle that's actually the easiest one of the easiest ways that we can do it without having um, you know, a large change in the pitch attitude because it's not a one-to-one -one ratio, but in relation to the horizon, what you will find is there is a direct correlation to the amount of nose up that you have at the stall correlates to the amount of nose down you're going to need to have on the recovery of the stall. You know, as a extreme example of that, if you think about it, is what happens if you pull into a complete vertical line, install the aircraft. The aircraft is going up like this and then ends up stalling. And what's gonna happen is the relative wind is gonna change suddenly to down near the earth as the aircraft starts to fall back down that way. And as a result, you're gonna need to lower the nose quite a bit in order to get below that angle of attack. So you will find that it is not a one-to-one -one relationship. It will vary from aircraft to aircraft, but there is a direct correlation to this. And manufacturers will use some of this non-standard standard terminology to talk about accelerated stalls like this. You may have heard, and I've seen this in different manuals, whip stall. You'll see that in the uh, Cessna manuals. Dynamic stall, you'll see that in the Diamond aircraft aggravated stall um i'm trying to think of what manufacturer i saw that one from it is out there i've, I've seen that too also zoom stall you know they'll talk about accelerated stalls in the vertical plane all using terminology like that that is non-standard terminology you know you also will hear it about a whip stall this is also something that is possible and can be very dangerous in hang gliders and also in weight shift control. When we talk about the pre and the post stall variables is how the amount, with the amount of nose up pitch attitude that was uh, there with it, how much nose down is required to recover. What you'll also notice because the pilot was hanging underneath and can move around quite a bit, you'll see the pre-stall variable 
uh, in relation to weight and CG location is in the recovery of that stall, where the weight is centered, the center of gravity changes tremendously on that poor pilot in that stall. Now, we thankfully should not have anything like that happening in our aircraft because we're small GA aircraft. If we do end up getting light like that, we should have everybody strapped in, should have all our um, stuff strapped down and everything. And, you know, that's why you check, like doing aerobatics or unusual attitude recoveries. You know, one of the first things that I have always done in most schools and training organizations do this is just an inverted flight check to make sure that the inverted fuel and oil system is working, but also to make sure that you don't have anything loose in the cockpit that'll go flying around as you're doing some of the more dramatic maneuvers that you're planning on later on. So, you know, we talk about it, the whole concept to this with these demonstration stalls is not to scare you, but to make you aware of conditions associated with stalling the aircraft in the areas where they can be hazardous. And these are the type of stalls that have a high degree of hazard and risk to us as pilots because they can happen when we're doing a go around. You know, we can get into the secondary stall if we are in that situation of we've had an engine failure and we're coming into land you know, off airport or something like that, we get nervous and stall and get into a secondary stall. You know, if we have not done our pre-takeoff checklist and don't have our trim set right and all of that, we can get in the elevator trim stall. We pull up too hard. You know, the classic, hey, y'all watch this uh, type of takeoff, you know, can be an accelerated stall. And there's even some stuff you might end up doing as a pilot, you know, commercial wise, a commercial pilot doing banner tow. You always are running the risk of an accelerated stall every time you're picking up a banner. Now, that's part of the training is you understand the limits for that aircraft, those conditions and what's involved with it. You also learn about what to do if you don't pick up the banner completely correctly uh, what you should end up doing to maintain the highest level of safety. But this is one of those type of operations where we are getting close to doing a demonstration type of stall quite often. And I fly and teach in gliders quite a bit. And this is one of the things that, you know, kind of scratches my head. In airplanes, you do the stalls up to 20 degrees of bank. The glider practical test standards are only to 15 degrees of bank. But the two most common places that a person would inadvertently stall an aircraft is the classic base to final, or more so when they're in a thermal, and especially if they're flying in what's known as a gaggle with many other gliders, like in a competition or something like that, where they're up at 45 degrees of bank. And you know, you want to have all the other glider pilots not be happy with you, go ahead and do it. Accelerated stall, even inadvertently, you know, which is what it could very likely happen if you were in a thermal gaggling with a bunch of other gliders. Yeah, is it would catch everybody's attention very, very quickly. Now, what we're trying to do here is also, as a flight instructor and with a student, understand the limits and design limits of the aircraft. You know, when we talk about accelerated stall, we're talking about something that is over at least the 1G stall speed with it, where, you know, we end up pulling harder. We have up to maneuvering speed, which is our limit load factor, you know, which is designed up to that speed. Technically, the aircraft should stall first before we exceed the limit load factor on the aircraft. In this case here, looks like a 4.4 G aircraft, like a 172 or something. Beyond maneuvering speed, if we do end up accelerating it too much, say up to five Gs before we end up stalling, there's a high likelihood that we've created structural damage. This is called limit load factor. Up here where you see the red, where we have structural failure, 
the design criteria for Part 23 aircraft is the limp, the ultimate load factor, where it changes from possibility of structural to the possibility of structural damage to the possibility of structural failure, should be 150% of the limit load factor. You know, so in here you're going to stall first beyond maneuvering speed for your given weight. You're, there's a high likelihood you will cause structural damage, and at the ultimate load factor and above, a high likelihood you're going to have structural failure. Now, also with instructors and us, you're probably familiar with this chart and even had some training and even maybe saw it on some of your knowledge tests. But notice here, you know, we talk about 60 degrees of bank, which is the classic 2G uh, turn. Most people know, recognize, understand that. And you may also recognize that associated with parachutes um, wearing is this is the point in time where the regulations basically say beyond the 60 degrees of bank, uh, you're going to end up needing to wear parachutes. You know, that it's not normal for the regular flight, it's aerobatic flight. If you're carrying passengers, everybody on board must end up having parachutes, so forth and so on. But notice here what happens is once you get beyond 60 degrees and especially 70 degrees, which is not much bank angle, the rate of change for small changes in bank angle becomes significant. You very easily, once you get beyond 60 degrees of bank, just by pulling and banking a little bit, you can very quickly get up to the limit load factor and even the ultimate load factor for your aircraft. And you're gonna get significant changes in your stall speed also. Why is that? If we go back to the other chart, we're talking about operating now up in this region. And this is why when you get beyond 60 degrees of bank, small errors here in terms of bank angle, how much you're pulling can be big changes in load factor, which very easily could end up bringing you into structural damage or structural failure, i.e. we, by the regulations are trying to reduce your risk by requiring you to wear a parachute at that point in time so that at least you have some backup to save yourself. So as we do depart today, just to review the demonstration stalls, we talked about the four different ones there uh, in relation to it. We talked about the elevator trim stall. We talked about the secondary stall. We talked about uh, the accelerated stall, both in the vertical plane, those stalls, what they are, how they're related to safety, loss of control, what we have in the practical test standards in the ACS requirements, what we do expect of the instructors that, you know, we should see them demonstrate it on the practical test, but we also want them to go ahead and be demonstrating these stalls to their students so that they know uh, what is going on, you know, so that they have a better understanding of the stall spin awareness. And we talked a little bit about what we should be testing, what you'll see in differences in the very in the demonstration and variations. So we do want to thank you. And if you have not, you, we do ask that you sign up for the WINGS program. The big thing is we want you to do proficiency flying, flight review, or whatever else it is with whatever group you're involved in at least once a year. If not, we ask, give the WINGS program a shot because we want you to be proficient pilots and do it once a year. You know, do something to reset your flight review. We do want to thank you for attending tonight too. You know, with being a proficient pilot, increases your peace of mind. So fly regularly with your CFI, work on perfect practice and document it in the wings. And thank you for part one, which we had here tonight. But remember, as part of the wings program, we all need to do part two. We all need to get out there and fly. So do you want to thank you for attending? We're going to have some answering questions here at the end if you want. You don't need to stick around for this. We're going to go ahead and stop the recording now.